welcome everyone to tonight's Citizens Climate University. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobby that provides CCL supporters like you and me with access to in-depth training and opportunities on topics related to climate change and effective climate advocacy, the wonderful Chad Wilsley. Dr. Wilsley is Director of Conservation Science at the National Audubon Society, where he leads a team of scientists conducting analyses in support of Audubon's national initiatives. Chad's own research focuses on the impacts of climate and land use changes for birds, and he has a PhD from the University of Washington and an MS from the University of Wisconsin. Thanks so much for being on the line tonight, Chad. So a quick review, what we're hoping people can take away from tonight's lesson is really the following threefold goals. First, we wanna make sure that attendees understand and are prepared to utilize Audubon's burden climate change reports in their local advocacy efforts. We also wanna make sure to provide that time to ask as experts that were behind the design of both these tools, the specific questions that you have about their use and the tips that they've had already seeing them field tested. And then lastly, we wanna make sure to also begin making a plan uh, and we encourage people to start doing that even as the webinar progresses of the best ways you can demonstrate these important local impacts of climate change in your own community to really fully leverage the tools storytelling. Excellent. Well, hey, I'm very excited to be uh, have this opportunity to speak with everyone tonight. Uh, my name is Chad Wilsey. I'm a scientist at the National Audubon Society. And I wanted to just start off giving a little bit of background on the National Audubon Society to orient you, and then we'll move into an analysis that we've done at national parks that we think could be a, an interesting way to communicate to legislators and others about the potential effects of climate change and, and using that for messaging around why it's important to take action to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So before getting into that, uh, just talking a little bit about the organization that I uh, represent, uh, National Audubon Society was first started in 1896 in Massachusetts, and it really was responding to uh, a popular trend at that time of using uh, feathers from birds to adorn hats. And uh, a few women uh, realized that this was going to quickly uh, get rid of all the birds that we had in our environment, and so they started to organize and to advocate for no longer using uh, live birds or bird feathers, uh, freshly harvested feathers in, in fashion. That was kind of the first, uh, first drive and advocacy uh, moment for Audubon. Uh, later on, Audubon played a key role in the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, Audubon was a key player in banning DDT, which was a pesticide that was having a negative impact primarily on raptors, including the bald eagle and peregrine falcon. And then more recently, back in uh, 2014, we had a major launch of an initiative around climate change, trying to communicate how climate change might impact uh, birds and where you see birds, and using that as a way to pivot towards advocating for uh, action to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Today, Audubon is uh, found in 23 states across the United States, and we have over 450 local chapters. As I mentioned, we've been involved in the issue of climate change pretty aggressively since 2014 when we launched our Birds and Climate Change Report, where we found that nearly half of bird species in North America were uh, threatened by climate change because uh, the areas that they currently live in uh, would no longer be suitable. They would no longer have climate conditions that the bird currently uh, is found in today, that those conditions would be found somewhere else. And so that would put those birds at risk. And one of the things that I want to uh, convey to you tonight is the idea that birds can serve as storytellers. Sometimes it's hard to think about what climate change might mean uh, in real terms and thinking about a bird that you love and not being able to see it in the future or thinking about a bird that's currently found really far away and how that bird might be, might be uh, found in your backyard in the future. Those kinds of stories are ways that we can uh, make climate change more real and more accessible to, uh, to a broader audience. And that's really what we're striving for at Audubon is to try to communicate what climate change might be in the language of birds. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is a study that we did in partnership with the National Park Service. So we all know that parks are places that people love. And what we wanted to do was to look at what climate change might mean for the birds that you find in national parks. Uh, and what might be some species that in your local park, uh, there might be a species that is no longer found there in the future, or there might be a species that are arrives and, and is found in the park in the future. And so trying to be able to tell those stories uh, using science 
to, to inform that. So I'm gonna start off by just talking about some of our main findings. National parks will be increasingly critical sanctuaries for birds, especially in winter. So what we actually found is that uh, national parks are gonna have more birds uh, in a changing climate that they currently have today. And so the, from an ag advocacy standpoint, that suggests that uh, we really need to continue investing in our national parks so that they can fill this important role. However, nearly a quarter of birds found in parks could be completely different by 2050 if carbon emissions continue at their current pace. So there's gonna be a lot of change in these national parks and that's a lot of uncertainty associated with that change. So there's a certain amount of risk uh, around all these changes that could be occurring in national parks. And um, perhaps we wanna to try to minimize that risk uh, by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We found that parks in the Midwest and Northeast will see the most amounts of change. So those are areas that are going to uh, be more dramatically impacted by climate change. And then we also found that uh, some migratory birds, birds that currently we only see in the summer, uh, they might be present year round in the future with a changing climate. And so that's another interesting uh, implication of climate change. So as I mentioned, uh, this is based on some of our work that was released in 2014 that was highlighting the potential risk of climate change to bird species across North America. And this work uh, really tried to project how the ranges of different bird species would shift in response to climate change. And so here's two examples. On the left is American goldfinch, and on the right is cedar waxwing. And what we can see here is the blue color is for the winter range, the yellow color is for the summer range. Anything that shows up in green is just uh, places that the species is expected to be found throughout the year. And you can see as we move from the present or near present 2000 into the future, how the areas of climatic conditions that are suitable to the species are projected to shift uh, with climate change. And so the, you know, if a species is gonna live in the same climatic conditions that it currently lives in, which is a reasonable uh, assumption, then the species is going to have to shift or move in response to climate change. And we can see how these are a little bit different for these two species, the, the goldfinch, which is currently found in the summer, kind of throughout the east and into the southeast, is projected to have suitable climate way up north in uh, what currently is kind of the boreal zone or, or the northern forests of, of North America. And then uh, similar to cedar waxwing, which is currently found in those northern forests, is projected to move up towards the Arctic. So what we wanted to do in our national park study was to take these continental projections and to kind of summarize them for a very local place. And we focused in on national parks. So what are the changes in a single national park? And can we summarize that and get a sense of the overall change and what species might, uh, might arrive in that park or colonize the park and what species might be locally extirpated from the park? And so for each of the national parks and for each of the species, we looked at our future projections and classified the species. Is the climate conditions going to be improving for the species, remain stable or worsening? Or might the species that's currently in the, found in the park today, might the climatic conditions no longer be suitable in the future? So that species perhaps might not be found in that park in the future. And we call that potential extirpation from the park. Similarly, there could be a species that's not in the park today that uh, climatic conditions in the future are such that the park has the, the species has the potential to colonize the park. And so on the right here, we kind of have a graphic that depicts this. The American robin is currently found in this park. These, these are species from Golden Gate National, Seashore, uh, National uh, Conservation uh, Area. And what we're seeing here is the American robin is a species that's currently found there. But in the future, the climatic conditions are such that we may no longer see the American robin. So it's a potential to be extirpated from the park. And then uh, the blue grosbeak is a species that's not in the park today. But in the future, uh, the climatic conditions are such that that species has the potential to colonize the park. In addition to those uh, five different categories, we quantified the overall turnover or the amount of change in the park. So that could be species that are either potentially extirpated or potentially colonizing the park. So again, we did this for 274 different park units. 
These include national parks, but also national monuments, national uh, riverways. There's lots of different classifications that are included. And we looked at over 500 different species, uh, over 300 in the summer, and uh, just under 400 in the winter. So let's talk about some of these main results. Uh, average turnover across parks was 23%. I mentioned this earlier. So this is just looking at those potential colonizers or potentially extirpated species. So that's a fair amount of change to think about uh, a quarter of species found in a park being different in the future. Parks are projected to become more important. We're expecting more species to be arriving or colonizing parks than are currently there today. And that's particularly true in the winter. You can think about with climate change, uh, winters are projected to be uh, more mild. And so there's more species that are gonna be found in these parks because they might be moving north or because they might be spending all year uh, in a park that they're currently only found in during the summer months. Uh, and so there is a, a four to one ratio of potential colonizers to uh, potential extirpation in, uh, in the winter. That's a pretty uh, dramatic trend. As I mentioned, we'll see the most change in the Midwest and the Northeast. In this diagram on the left, uh, the greatest change is characterized by the darkest color and the largest circles. So you see the darkest color and the largest circles in the Midwest, in the Northeast. And on the right, same information using these bar charts and the bars that are above this dotted line are again in the Midwest and in the Northeast, and also in the National Capital Area. As I mentioned, some migratory birds uh, may remain in certain parks year round. On average, across all parks, we can have as many as seven species that are currently only there in the summer that are found year round. And then, and this might be the, the result that uh, is most appealing and, and uh, impactful for you, is that really if we are able to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then we are, um, all of these changes that I'm talking about in this, in this talk are gonna be less dra dramatic. And so this bar chart here is showing the percentage of parks with more than one quarter um, of summer species in danger of extirpation by 2050. And if we think about a, a higher emissions pathway, which is more similar to where we're heading right now, that's about 25% of, of parks. And then if we're actually able to reduce our uh, emissions and have less carbon in the atmosphere, then we can have that reduced down to 8%. So that's a pretty dramatic difference uh, if we're able to take uh, action on, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And really this, uh, this pattern is the same for a number of different measures. Here I'm just showing the percentage of parks with more than a quarter of their species in danger of extirpation, but the same pattern uh, occurs if we're looking at overall turnover, the potential of uh, the number of species with potential colonization, potential extirpation, and then parks with more colonization than extirpation. Uh, there's all of these uh, measures have a uh, higher change with greater emissions. Okay, and then we've, uh, we've set up a website that summarizes this information and gives you the opportunity to zoom into an individual park and explore some of these patterns and some of the species and what their projections are for individual parks. And so that's what I'm gonna do right now is to drop off. Here we can see a website, but I've actually uh, kind of prepped this a little bit advanced just so that we're not waiting for these pages to load. Right on. So this is, uh, this is our page. If you go right to our Audubon Birds and Climate Change our National Parks page, you have the opportunity here to click on a little bit more information. So there's there's a, there's a link to get more information about the study, which is up here. We have this, uh, this fact, this frequently asked questions where you can explore and get uh, some of these uh, most common questions answered about the, uh, about the study. You can also link to our peer reviewed study. We've actually published this in a scientific journal and you can access that here. And then you can also click here to, to look for a park near you. And so I have loaded this page as well. And so again, we have done this for 274 different park units. So you can think about the representative that you're gonna visit uh, if you're doing some advocacy and uh, identify whether there's a national park near that uh, representative and then come and look for the projections for that individual park uh, here. And you just search by state or alphabetically by park.
Now the website, so that gives you access to all 274 park units, but the website that we've developed here with some more rich visuals uh, is really for just the congressionally designated parks, the 53 national parks, the kind of what we think about when we think about national parks. And I'm just gonna kind of zoom through uh, some of the information content on this park page. So we have um, just this headline that I've already given to you, you know, almost a quarter of species are projected to uh, change under a changing climate across all of our national parks. And then we have this, uh, this great interactive that helps you to visualize kind of what this means. And so we can look at, you know, for this is just a generic park right now. These are the species that we find in the park today, 83 species. And if we zoom forward to the mid middle of the century, this uh, animation is just giving you a visual way of thinking about new species that potentially are colonizing the park, as well as some of the species that are currently present in the park that are potentially extirpated from the park in the future. So this, this interactive graphic just gives you a way to visualize kind of what this means or what this might look like. Then we have uh, a way to access uh, individual parks and information on those parks. Uh, this is thinking about colonizations, potential colonizations. So 100% of the 270 parks uh, are, have more species likely to colonize than to be extirpated in the winter. So here we're able to look at colonizations across parks and you can uh, click on an individual park. So if I was interested, I was in Minnesota and I was interested in Voyagers uh, National Park, I could click on this park here and then click through to the park itself and see a page that summarizes information on that park. So here I've, uh, I've gone through and uh, identified Voyagers National Park. So at the top, we have a picture that represents the park. Here you can access the park specific brief again, another ac access point. You could also click on a website from the National Park Service about the park. And then here again, we just have this interactive graphic that allows us to look at uh, change in the summer and winter. So right now we're, we're clicked on the summer, so we can see how many species are in the park today, uh, what proportion or what number of species are potentially colonizing the park, and what number are potentially uh, leaving the park. And, uh, and this is a park where there's kind of an interesting story around extirpations. There's a few species that are found in this park that are really uh, only found in the northern part of our country and, and in the particular in the, uh, in the future under a changing climate, there's a real potential for those species to be no longer found in, uh, in Voyagers National Park. One of those is cedar waxwing, which I showed you an animation of earlier. So you can actually click on cedar waxwing and it'll say, take you to a, a page that's dedicated to the cedar waxwing, where you can see an image of the bird, learn about its natural history, and see a range map for the present of the species. So where do we see the species today? And then under a changing climate, as I mentioned, uh, the projections are that we would no longer see that species in the summer in, uh, in Voyagers National Park, which is in northern Minnesota. But the example that I wanted to give uh, for potential colonization, uh, Badlands National Park. So let me, let me do that now. I want to just, this uh, banner here for, the, for Zoom is kind of, getting my way here. So this is, this is for Badlands National Park, which is located in uh, South Dakota. And here's a park where we have the potential for some species that are currently found way south to be found in the park in the future, to be potential colonizers. A couple of examples are scaled quail, which is currently found in New Mexico, and scissor-tailed fly catcher, which is currently found in Texas and New Mexico. These are species that have this potential to be colonizing the park in the future under a changing climate. So it gives you the sense, again, uh, thinking about birds as storytellers, these species that are currently found way south in Mexico and the southern U.S. could be found in the park in the future. And so being able to tell that story and uh, potentially uh, make this a little bit more real to the public or to a congressman, uh, what the potential impacts of climate change are. So this is scissor tail flycatcher. Again, just a species that's currently found in Oklahoma and Texas uh, under a changing climate could be found as far north as uh, South Dakota and Badlands National Park. So birds as storytellers is just a theme that I wanted to develop uh, in our talk today. And then other, uh, going back to that other landing page, you know, the stories that I mentioned earlier around uh, migratory birds that 
uh, potentially are going to be found in parks year-round under a changing climate. And then lastly, uh, this story that I mentioned in the PowerPoint presentation, that uh, change is much less dramatic uh, if we are able to reduce uh, future emissions uh, and future warming due to climate change. And then lastly, uh, if you are interested in kind of those uh, quick graphics that show the amount of change in every park. At the bottom of this website page, you can look at any of the parks and see one of these little graphic animations to just give you a quick way of summarizing the amount of change that might occur in a national park. And you could take a, take a screenshot or, or save that and add that to a, a handout that you might be giving to a, to a representative. And similarly, uh, handouts for the representatives could be just these briefs themselves, which are which are uh, PDFs. So if you are located in uh, North Carolina and you wanted to talk to a uh, representative or senator from, from one of the districts that overlaps with a national park, here's Great Smoky Mountain National Park, you could download this, uh, this PDF and, uh, and share that if you were wanted to tell a story about climate change and what its potential impacts might be to parks and why they should take action. So with that, I just had a couple of more slides here uh, before winding down. Uh, again, our main findings as I already went through. And then lastly, uh, from our standpoint, the things that we're using this information to advocate around is first of all, support for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is a, a federal program that's actually up for reauthorization this year. Uh, that's a program that takes uh, monies from offshore drilling and invests it in conservation. And it's actually uh, a lot of those funds go to national parks and other federal lands to increase their, um, their footprint, to increase their size and acquire new lands, as well as to do upgrades on infrastructure or to improve management of endangered species. And then, of course, as I mentioned, Audubon has a, an initiative focused on climate and advocacy in favor of legislation that reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so we are also using this information to advocate, to be advocates. And we're excited about the possibility that you would also consider using this information as well. And then also we, uh, we have a program called uh, Plants for Birds that uh, just at an individual level, thinking about ways that you can plant uh, plants in your backyard that are important providing important forage for birds and will help those species uh, be able to adapt to uh, climate change. So thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'd like to ask how it's affecting other issues of balance of nature. Yeah, so I think that, that kind of top line message of 25% of species uh, changing, you know, that's a pretty high amount of ecological change. And so I think just emphasizing that and saying, you know, we know, we know this about birds, you know, this is reverberated through the entire ecosystem. And uh, it's just a lot of change. It's a lot of change. And so, and there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that change. And so, you know, do, do we want to continue on a path where we just have to expect all of our natural systems to respond and adapt? Or do we want to take action to, uh, to reduce the amount of change that, that these places are going to experience and the stress that we're trying to put on these places? Thank you so much, Chad. This is incredibly powerful and you told the story very well. Chad, we are giving you a huge round of applause for your involvement and just taking the time tonight to educate all of us. And uh, at this point, uh, we just wish everyone all the empowerment needed to really use these tools as effectively as possible across the country. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Brett. Good evening. Thanks, Chad.